for the Rules and Open Government Committee and Committee of the Whole. Uh, Tony, can you take roll call, please? Arenas? Here. Cohen? Here. Davis? Here. Carlos? Here. Jones? Present. And I'm going to play that video now. Okay. So, so uh, Tony, I, I know I had a hard time hearing, hearing that. Um, Did I, I don't know how if the audience was able to. Okay. I'm not used to sharing videos with audio. Okay. I don't know what I did wrong, but I do have a Word document I can throw up there um, that has the same information, but in um, English. Yeah, let's, let's put that up for a minute. Writing. I should, I meant in writing. I, I know what you meant. Yeah. Let's go ahead and put it up. Just yep. So. Okay. And then as, as a reminder, if um, the public speakers are being interpreted in order to hear them, you will also, as panelists, need to go to the interpretation button at the bottom, switch over to the, the English or Spanish channel, uh, the Spanish channel to hear the, to hear the translation. Got it. Thank you. So next, uh, we're going to review the council meeting uh, agenda for Tuesday, March 30th. And we're going to start out uh, pages four and five. Let's see, we have a closed session starts at nine. Pages six and seven. eight and nine, 10 and 11, 12 and 13, and on page 13, we have the illegal street racing. I imagine that's going to be a pretty popular topic. The, um, the version I'm showing on the screen has slightly different language than what you received earlier today. Oh, OK. Um, it was to, it's added this language to explore installation of physical barriers at wider intersections. So that's added. That was based on rules direction. Oh. the same. Thank you, Tony. All right, pages 14 and 15. Sixteen and seventeen. And that's it. And so I am going to go to the public. And we have two public speakers. First one is Blair. Uh, can I have two minutes, not just one minute? Yeah, sorry. Can you, can you give me one sec so I can change the timer? I'll, I can do it really quickly. No, no worries. Thank you, Vice. We also have an ad sheet.
while he changes that, I'm going to pull up the ad sheet. Thank you, Tony. So we have an excused absence request. We have a three items related to COVID and the commission's appointments. Okay. So Henry, are we good? Yeah, I'm pulling it up now. Thanks for waiting. Okay. All right, go ahead, Blair. Great, hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, Thanks for the meeting last night. It was uh, interesting, uh, kind of sad, but interesting that we're all able to state our point of views and our good ideals and uh, we, we move forward and uh, together basically and uh, begin our work. So thank you. Um, yeah, it was sad and encouraging <laughs> both, I guess. Um, for the few items uh, today of interest on this agenda item uh, for the street racing and the uh, sideshow issues, as I've been trying to offer uh, the past month, you know, um, if you're going to be having uh, countywide uh, commissions on the process, uh, you know, and, and possible technology use uh, for the sideshows, why not consider inviting, uh, you know, the ACLU and uh, CARE uh, uh, you know, M American Islamic Relations, uh, Council of American Islamic Relations, uh, at, you know, to the process and ask them to speak on 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 issues of, of, of open public policy and, and good civil protection practices at this time. I think that would invite, you know, the sideshow community themselves to the process. And, uh, you know, it's that good feeling that, uh, is, is how to ask them to stop or make changes and grow. <laughs> um, so it's an interesting concept. I hope you can work on it. And about the, uh, the others, another item about uh, government uh, practices during council meetings, um, I just don't have enough time <laughs> now. Maybe I can talk about it during a public comment open forum and uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person whose number ends in 9306. Go ahead. You're still on mute. Okay, we lost them. So, Hong, you're up next. Uh, go ahead and uh, take yourself off mute. Go ahead. Okay, looks like we lost them as well. So I'm going to bring it back to the committee. And um, again, we have an ad sheet as well. So um, I'll move the uh, to adopt the agenda with the ad sheet. All right. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded, and uh, I see Council Member Davis has some input. So go ahead, Council Member. Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, for the illegal street racing item, which I just lost the, I had the ad sheet up instead of the agenda, so I don't remember the number, but um, for the illegal street racing item, could we say that that's um, not before four? I know there are times certain of 6 p.m. on the housing items. So I was thinking if we can say not before four, it's it's item 4.1. Right, right. Do we have COVID update that day? We do not. That's the following week on April 6th. Okay. Yeah, so can we do a not before four for the uh, item 4.1? That's fine. Um... If it's all right with the seconder. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right. 
next is the agenda for Tuesday, April 6th. Again, starting out with a nine o'clock closed session. And we're gonna look at pages four and five. Six and seven. Eight and nine. And that's, that's it, it's a short one, but there is an ad sheet. So I'm gonna to go to public comments first. And Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thank you. Um, uh, there's an item about uh, bike sharing bike plan issues, uh, you know, the future of uh, uh, bike pathways, all the good stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm really interested how you're doing work on the east side, uh, citywide bike plan update. And there is a, uh, yeah, with a design group. Uh, I'm really interested in how this can be an issue of, um, equity. And uh, I know that there's been some really interesting ideas growing on the east side with the future of bike trails. Uh, it's really encouraging. And I know in, ten, in attending VTA meetings that, you know, the, the, the new concepts of equity, we're starting to ask new questions of previous VTA plans and work plans towards bike trails and how they were previously working. Not that it was so bad necessarily, but that we're simply improving and we're having, we're developing uh, more interesting uh, ideas now uh, for, for the ideas of equity and issues of, of the East side. And that respects, I, I, I would imagine the goal is to respect uh, all parts of a community uh, in working on East side issues of bike lanes. And the fact that uh, the VTA is currently working on a, a super highway bike lane structure in North San Jose, it's interesting, but it doesn't fully address, you know, South San Jose and East San Jose. And I wonder how, you know, your good efforts will, you know, San Jose seems to have an important uh, purpose in, in to help the VTA at this time. And, and I, I hope it can be a good purpose to show you know, east side ideas and south San Jose ideas. And uh, good luck in your efforts. I thought I'd just make it known what I know at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Person who ends, whose number ends in 9306. Go ahead. You're still on mute. All right. Um, looks like uh, the person might be having some problems. Uh, so you're off mute now. The person in, who's ending in 9306, of which we just lost. So Hung? Uh, you're next, so go ahead. And you're able to talk. Um, I work in the Fairmont Hotel for uh, five, over five years. So I uh, want to return to work together as soon as possible. Can you help uh, support us? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. All right, uh, actually we have one more uh, public speaker, Joaquin. Go ahead, Joaquin. 
I am Joaquin Benitez from Monterey. I'm, I am here to support San Jose workers to help them to return to work. Chair, I think these individuals are, are trying to speak, speak on, uh, on the item later on agenda. Yeah, I, I, I gather that. He was uh, on and off so quickly, I didn't get a chance to, to state that. But yes, I believe those speakers were trying to speak on that other item. So we're going to um, we're going to bring it back to the committee. And uh, if I can get a motion. Move to adopt the agenda with the ad sheet. Second. Okay. All right. So Just have a quick question. Is this, there's no rules committee next week. Is that right? That's correct. It's a so this is, so is there, is there a way that this can't be amended then this agenda after, after today? So um, typically when we don't have a, an official rules meeting, um, staff still um, <clears throat> will hold a meeting and make changes to, to the agenda. Oh, okay. And, and Lee, I don't know if, uh, if you want to walk us through how that, that could possibly work. There's a, there's a rules in lieu to, to get everyone up to speed on the agenda. Um, if we recommend any changes on the agenda, it can be done during orders of the day as well as you um, as council during orders of the day. If you wanted to specify anything time specific, you could do that on the actual afternoon of the 6th. When I was also asking because it I suppose if we if we vote later to put something on the April 6th agenda, it gets put there without needing to review the agenda again, right? Okay. That's correct. All right. So as we move in second it. Uh... Hi. Hi, this is Tony. So uh, to throw a monkey wrench in it, we do not have a rules in lieu for next week. Um, but if that has changes that we need to make on the agenda, we can make those changes, but it's generally, um, if it's something that needs to be to happen under orders of the day, we can do that. We would just put language on there that's like, please accept that, you know, a time certain or a deferral or so we can still do it, but it'll just look a little different on the agenda. You see, so you guys will be approving it at the beginning of the day under orders of the day on the sixth. Got it. All right. Any other questions? Let's vote. Tony. Arenas. Yes. Cohen? Yes. Aye. Davis? Aye. Perales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. So next item is D1, a set general plan hearing for April 2021. I'm going to go to the public speakers first and person whose number ends in 9306. Go ahead. If you're on mute, uh, please hit star six to take yourself off mute. Please hit uh, star six. Okay, we lost them again. So we're gonna go back to the committee. And if I can get a motion, please. Move approval. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony? Marinas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next is the public record. And I will go to the public first. Uh, and again, the person whose number ends in 9306. Let's see if we can get it to be successful this time. You have permission to talk and you are still on mute. So we're going to go to the next speaker who just 
disappeared. So right now we don't have any other hands up. So I'm bringing it back to the committee. Can I get a motion, please? Of approval. Can I get a second? Second. You guys are as tired as I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was a late count I thought, I was, I thought I was the only one. We're right there with you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> I appreciate it. Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Davis? Aye. Perales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to up the energy level here. How's that? Okay, next item is the consent calendar. And I will go I will to public, public speakers. speakers. I'll move approval. Thank you. Second. And I have, I had one public speaker, but they disappeared. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony. Arenas. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Davis. Aye. Prowlis. Aye. Jones. Aye. Thank you. Next is G2 um, nomination of the Alameda Park. Uh, how do you pronounce that, uh, Dev? Shiwi. Uh, Shiwi. Avenue Historic District. And um, I see a hand raised, um, same person, 9306. We're gonna give it one, one more shot. Um, if you could take yourself off mute and go ahead. Or if not, uh, let's go to the next public speaker, Anna or Anna. Hello? Yes, Anna? Yes, my name is Anna Jin. I work at Fairman Hotel at um, 20 years. So please talk to return to work. Anna, um, you're um, speaking on the, an item is gonna is coming up next, but uh, we appreciate your input, and you can also um, raise your hand for the item when it comes up as well. Thank you. All right, bring it back to the committee, uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Um, pretty straightforward item. Thanks to staff for giving it the green light. They've been working with uh, the neighborhood on Sheely Avenue for this um, historic district for probably about two years already. And of course, many years before that, but we're, we're getting close to the end. And so this is um, the, sort of just the next step. So move approval. Can I get a second, please? Second. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Rosalind, I see that you're, you're here. Did you uh, have any input or should we just keep moving? You can keep moving. I'm just here to answer any questions you may have. That's what I figured. Uh, also, um, Councilmember Reyes, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I do. And um, I, I, I appreciate the support for um, to designate historical sites throughout the city of San Jose. It's a way of honoring our history. It's on the honor of looking back and saying that's where we were. This is where we are now. And um, in between, uh, in terms of looking back where we were and where we are now, there's some history that is probably some that we'd like to sweep under the rug because we're not proud of. And you've heard from many of our speakers, um, not only at rules, but um, during many of our council meetings talk about the redlining that has happened in our, um, in our city. And I know this particular uh, uh, neighborhood was also built exclusively um, to not have people of color in it. Um, there were documents that were part of that redlining. Um, 
And um, and so it was, I think it, back in 1937, no black or foreign born residents lived in that neighborhood. Um, and I would say there's probably a chance that that continues to happen um, with some exceptions, of course. And so for me, I, I really want us to um, be mindful of what the history has been for the city of San Jose and that some of these single family homes are uh, were, were a way um, to keep people of color out of neighborhoods. And so I want to uh, make a substitute motion. I will, uh, um, of course, include the memo that uh, my council colleague has um, put forward, but I, what I with with this addition, and that is to put the the work that staff has um, this needs to do on this on hold until after we can get some staff analysis from the upcoming fair housing work plan items that will be coming to NSC and then later to uh, council this year. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure that I continue to push for historical preservation, um, but we also need to be very uh, aware and ve very uh, sensitive to the effects of our action to lock in racist policies of the past, such as segregation and red redlining. So we need to have this fair housing work plan as, um, as an overlay to the work that's being done here. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Davis. So that's a motion. That's a substitute uh, um, motion. Substitute motion. And uh, is there a second? I'll second it for purpose of uh, discussion at the moment. So. Okay. So, Council Member Davis. Rosalind, can you explain um, if the, if the, those are the same staff working on? On those two items, my understanding was these are completely different staff working on historic preservation. And maybe if you want to talk about um, historic preservation, what that designation means might be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so the procedure for um, nominating historic districts in the city is actually covered in our muni code in Title 13. Um, and, and basically, um, you know, we, the city considers his nominations for historic districts based on a series of information that is provided. So obviously uh, the city is looking at um, a statement of an area's historical significance, um, cultural value, um, architectural and design value. Um, we obviously require um, drawings and or um, photographs or other materials that provide the documentation um, of that history. And then, of course, we're looking for a map um, to identify the proposed area. Um, so our historic preservation program is located in the planning division of PBCE. Um, and this is a separate department and staff um, that's working um, not working on the fair housing uh, work plan, which is, of course is housed in the housing department. Thank you. So we're talking about two completely different staff, different staffs working on on these items. That's Thank correct. You. I'm not going to be supporting the substitute motion. I think um, these neighbors have have been working and waiting. Um, and working with PBCE, and this is completely separate from from the work plan that um, that Councilmember Reynas brought. Okay. Any um, Councilmember Reynas, I see you still have your hand up. Uh, yes, I, I raised it once again, and I completely understand that these are two separate workloads. I'm not confusing the issue. I know that these are two completely different workloads. The issue here is that we both sat in uh, the general plan task force. And when the topic of opportunity housing came up, I heard a lot of neighbors, not only in district three, but in district six and a lot of uh, uh, areas of San Jose where these single family homes translate into white neighborhoods, um, use a historical preservation as an excuse not to build 
multiple multi-housing units, which basically are duplexes and fourplexes that are already part of this neighborhood. But those that verbiage elicits um, the imagery of people of color moving into your neighborhood. And so we um, had about two hours worth of of uh, comments because somebody decided, and I probably it was David Pandori who decided to misinform people about opportunity housing. And uh, Commissioner uh, Pierre Luigi continues to do this in um, District 6. Um, and, uh, and from what I understand, this would make potentially opportunity housing sites in historic districts um, more difficult. And so, People would have to file a single family house permit, which means an opportunity housing development wouldn't be by right. Uh, the single family's house permit would need to go to, to the director's hearing and then may require community meeting. So this is all uh, interrelated. And um, this is why I wanted to have this have an overlay um, with a fair housing plan to make sure that this is not the intent of this neighborhood to do, to continue to segregate themselves and to protect themselves from opportunity housing. All right, thank you. Um, Council Member Brawls. Yeah, thank you and appreciate the, the context there. I was, that's why I seconded it because I wanted to be able to discuss it. I, I, I wasn't certain sort of where that was coming from. Um, it looked like it was greenlit from staff and so I didn't see any concern there. Maybe, uh, Rosa, you can help answer. I don't suspect um, that what uh, Councilmember Dennis is saying is false. I've also heard this notion coming from my own community members uh, in the interest of trying to uh, oppose opportunity housing. Is that something possible that, that um, indeed, if somebody were, uh, you know, residents were able to, to get a recognition like this, uh, that that would then help them to be able to uh, opt out or, or have their neighborhood not be included in opportunity housing? So council member, um, the current proposal for opportunity housing, first of all, it's, it's still a draft um, proposal. It's in concept form currently, and we haven't been able to bring the concept to council for, for, for their consideration. However, currently as staff um, has been thinking about the opportunity housing concept is that um, it would apply to historic districts. That's the current concept. Um, obviously staff, and we had talked about this with the general plan for your review task force, um, we would also be looking at um, design standards or measures um, along with that, which we are looking to do really for opportunity housing across the city as well. Um, so that's the current concept. Um, again, because it's a concept and it's proposal, and again, it's a separate work plan item in our department. It's separate from our historic preservation program. I don't want to... Uh, confuse the two because there's they are two separate work items, but um, currently as proposed opportunity housing uh, would would be applied to historic districts as well. Can I interject uh, Council Member Pro so I can tell you where and I can cite where I got this information? Sure. So this is coming from Jared uh, Ferguson, um, as well as Jessica within our own uh, our city of San Jose. Um, and the Housing Catalyst Office of Economic Development for, for Jared. Not sure, I think Jessica's probably in PBCE, um, but this is where I got that information. They said that they that uh, these historical, historic um, uh, preservation areas would have to file a single family house permit, um, and then they would have to go to a director's hearing and then require um, a community meeting. So this is, you know, I didn't get this from thin air. This is something that staff has given to me. Um, and I'm not opposing the historical preservation um, uh, designation. What I'm asking is to have um, 
the fair housing uh, work plan and the staff that um, oversees that, take a look at this and have an overlay of that work with this to see if, if it is in line indeed, are we continuing to um, segregate neighborhoods um, by designating them historical? Because I can tell you, I live five minutes away from a barn that has horses um, and has orchards. And I could very well say that my district has some very meaningful historical areas. And I could see my district also doing the same thing in order to protect themselves um, from what they think opportun opportunity housing is, is, um, is going to create for them. And I know, Rosalind, you just were in my district about a week ago talking about opportunity housing, and there's a lot of misinformation about that. And so I think it's creating um, possibly some folks to continue with this preservation, um, maybe strategy. So I'm not, I'm not opposing the designation. All I'm asking is for that department that takes care of the fair housing work plan to overlay, to, to review this uh, historical preservation designation in order to ensure that we are not continuing to segregate folks. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, if I oh, go ahead. So continue. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Staff, I don't know, Rosalind, can you answer what would that look like if we were to 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 accept this current direction and 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 ask for for that analysis and that overlay? I'm not sure if I have a specific answer to that question right now, council member. I mean, obviously it would require our planning staff to coordinate with the housing department staff um, on their work on fair housing. I, I'm not sure about their work plan and their schedule. So we would have to coordinate with them um, along those lines. Okay, and it, it sounds like based on what I'm looking at, and I'll ask Councilmember uh, Davis, I don't know if there's any urgency in this, and, and I would obviously myself as well like for, for this to be supported without any sort of cloud over it. Um, is there, I know you said you wouldn't be in favor of, of this direction. Is there some sort of urgency uh, where you wouldn't want to try to alleviate this concern that maybe there's you know, there's a there's some some other ill intent on on doing this. So I'll tell you, Council Member Prellis, uh, I live in a neighborhood that had this historic designation happen during my term, and I do not live in a contributing house. But the process took 12 years to get done because it was started right before the last recession, and then it got put on a shelf. And the person who was working on it left and there was no historic preservation officer for many years. So the other, the Sheely that we're bringing forward now had started that process right around the same time. So they're going on now almost 15 years. It's not, this has nothing to do with opportunity housing because they started this process long, long ago. And what their major concern was and why they ramped up their activities was before this, uh, when Google started buying property and they were concerned about their homes are all much, they're small homes, more like what people considered, you know, start, starter homes. They're all sort of one story. Some of them are two stories, um, but very few of them are. And they're worried about their, um, the value of their land and losing the structures because of um, speculators coming in to actually, you know, just do the cookie cutter McMansions because it's going to be within walking distance to the Google property. It had nothing to do with opportunity housing. It had more to do with worrying about losing the structures and the the historic street, which is it's a really cute street if you've ever um, been down there. And there's plenty of um, just one or two blocks away. There are there are apartment buildings, so I don't think that. That's not a concern for for the people on the street. Um, they know they live in a, you know, it's downtown adjacent. It's not downtown, um, but it's very much wanting to keep the the cohesive design 
of the of the street intact and worrying about the the Google impact to the to the street. So that was where that was where it came from, and that's why they um, had some urgency in the last couple of years. Well, since you know, since the announcement of okay. Google, and what was it, twenty seventeen? Yeah, thank you for that context. And Rosen, maybe can you tell me this here? What what what, what we would be uh, potentially moving forward um, would be a nomination, and it would initiate. A process, right? So, what what does that actually look like? Can you kind of walk us through what what actually gets triggered here? Sure. So, as I mentioned earlier, you're right, Council Member. This is step one: a nomination um, of a proposed historic district. Um, so, staff would gather all of those materials, the statement um, that's that's going to be required, um, making sure that there's been um, adequate community outreach. Um, and in fact, we've been working with the community and they've actually got documentation um, of the previous community outreach and engagement. Uh, we would bring together all of the photographs, the documentation, the drawings that are gonna be required for the application as well as the mapping. And in terms of next steps, um, the application would go to the Historic Landmarks Commission for their review and recommendation. Uh, then it would go to the Planning Commission for their review and recommendation, and then come back uh, to the City Council for final action. Okay, thank you. Um, and are you aware in your conversations with the community here uh, of the, the prior work they had done? I am aware of the um, the the North Willow Glen Gardner community uh, where Councilmember Davis was was relating to and, and aware of how many how many years they've been working on that. Are you aware of the the timeline? Does that match up with what Councilmember uh, Davis was saying? Uh, well, Councilmember, a lot of this work predates me, unfortunately. Um, but I know that um, many members in the community have long desired to move forward. And, and you know, I know for a fact that a, a lot um, of these ideas and recommendations actually came out of the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. Um, so I guess that's from the early 2000s or to 2010. And so many of those desires and recommendations for both conservation area and historic district came out of that, that work with the community. So um, yes, it has taken quite some time um, due to staffing impacts to actually move forward with, with many of those recommendations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm aware of that within, again, that, that, that the area around. Councilor Davis is uh, where she lives. And so um, I don't disagree with Councilor Dennis that um, you know, there could be potentially some other interesting or, or other interests in why someone would want this designation. Um, I don't particularly think this neighborhood is, is, is moving forward with this for that purpose because I, I, I do believe that they started this uh, long before the, the current opportunity housing process. At the same time, I, I also recognize the impacts that the community has had um, due to historical redlining uh, and other racist policies. And, 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 you know, we just have to be cognizant of that as we move forward. And, and, and in order to actually look at undoing some of those historical wrongs, um, if there are decisions that we make today, for instance, like giving historical designations, um, I think we should be aware of that. And I think that's what Council Member Arenas is saying is, is let's let's make sure of that. What I what I don't necessarily want to do is utilize this particular um, this particular community as as kind of the 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 catalyst or or the guinea pig, if you will, to say, hey, uh, let's not move forward on this uh, work that you've been doing for years um, because we we feel as though we we really want to compare this historical. Uh, these historic designations um, with the um, with the work really on fair housing, um, and so uh, I I can support in a you know in a separate line of work, uh, Councilmember Redenas. The I think the request that you're making, um, I don't necessarily want to hold up this particular item that, that staff has 
um, greenlit and that I think that this community genuinely has put forward without the interest of, of trying to oppose opportunity housing. Um, so if you're, you're interested in, in moving something else, um, you know, in regards to, to that action, I'd be comfortable with supporting that, but I, I won't support, um, I won't support that today. I will support the underlying motion. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cohen. I think Council Member Perales kind of covered what I was going to say. I, I, I just wasn't sure about how this, what, what, what specifically Council Member Reynas was looking for as far as timing on this, because this is, this looks like it's a first step starting a process that would still come to Council for approval. And so uh, it was the recommendation to, to delay starting the process or to delay bringing it to Council. It's not even clear, it's not clear to me what that, that recommendation is, since you said you're not, you don't want to stop the actual designation. The process has to occur. So I think what we're doing today is approving the beginning of the process and not approving the historical designation. Is that, that correct, Rosalind? Yes, council member, that's correct. Right, so, I, I'm, so I'm not sure how, what specifically the motion would be, but I, anyway, so I'm gonna let council member Reynas explain if, she, if there's something I'm misunderstanding, but I know it's her hands up, so she'll be speaking next anyway. So that's all I want to say is I don't see how this, um, necessarily, you know, how it affects the timeline and, and why it should affect the beginning of the process rather than the approval at the end, if in fact that's something the council wants to discuss later. Thank you, council member Reyes. Sure, and, uh, and both of you are right. I'm not trying to stop the process and I could compromise in terms of a, um, having my motion reflect to allow uh, for that process to begin. Uh, the one that Rosalind just finished describing in terms of, you know, gathering the photos, having the, the staff move along that, but before, um, um, before it is uh, designated um, to have um, a bit of a review from the fair housing plan or from the staff the, that um, are in charge of the fa fair housing plan. And, and, this is, and this is the reason why. Council member Davis just finished saying that there was a motivation outside of having this historical preservation designation. And it was because of Google and it was to protect their properties. So it wasn't the original intent that was meant 12 years ago. It was a recent interest. And in her memo, Marie, um, this particular district derives its importance from being an intact, intact representation of early suburban development in the greater San Jose area with identifying an identifiable attributes embodied in its single family residential architecture pattern of development and continuous res residential setting. So why make mention of that? I wanna make sure that when we designate something historical, that we also recognize that in that, in keeping intact the representation of early suburban development, it's not necessarily something that San Jose should be completely proud of, because that means that that was an all white neighborhood. And what I'm asking is for there, for, um, there to be historical context to that. And so an overlay with a fair housing plan or the staff of the fair housing plan, or at least some input from them to recognize um, this historical preservation is not to uh, memorialize redlining, but the way it's written, I mean, you know, we want to make sure it's intact and that this is early suburban development. Well, we, we are not in early suburban development. They're next to the downtown area. And, um, and I, I have got to say that even though you say this started 12 years ago, there is some recent motivation. And I wouldn't expect um, for that to be revealed now in terms of outside of just Google. Obviously, it, it was Google and, and their fear of having their neighborhood disrupt, um, look differently. And maybe it should. 
Maybe it should have more faces of color in it and maybe we should have more ownership by people of color. So I, at the very least, I'd like to have some recognition of, of those, those racially inequitable um, policies that allowed for this type of early suburban development to exist in San Jose. And to call it historical is an offense and an insult to the rest of us who could not live in that neighborhood until as of late. So what I'm asking for is for there to be review. We can continue to have the process move forward but I'd like to have some review so that there could be more context to the history of uh, and the designation to this particular area. I don't know if we should be that proud of this district for its redlining history. All right, um, Council Member Davis. So I'll do respect Council Member Reynos if you want the historic preservation process to change Please don't do it by ambushing me at a rules meeting on a random Wednesday. Bring your own memo to change the process and not to punish one neighborhood that's been working for a dozen years and they've been working on it. The reason it amped up is because they were afraid not of their neighbors changing, but of the structures changing. They like the way the houses look. It's a beautiful tree-lined street with 100-year-old houses. That was not in danger until Google made their announcement. It has nothing to do with who lives in those houses from anything that I've garnered from conversations with any of the neighbors. You can choose to believe that or not, but if you want the historic designation process to change, bring your own memo about that. For right it now- It is my right to speak for right up now, for Council everybody. Council Member Reyes, let uh, Council Member Davis- uh, For right now, finish. let's let these neighbors go forward with the process that they knew to be the process this entire time and not pull the rug out from under them. I will not be supporting your motion. Okay, and, and I will- um, Go to Council Member Prowse, but I just want to um, say uh, that based on everything I've heard, I feel very confident that the the motivation behind the neighborhood want to wanting to have the historic designation is sincere and it's not motivated by um, concerns about opportunity housing. And, and also, what I heard from Council Member Davis was also that the prospect of Google coming in was a motivator for them in terms of their timeline and not to actually make the uh, designation itself. So uh, Rosalind, if we um, move forward with the uh, original motion or the underlying motion, what or where are there opportunities to uh, at least um, address some of council member Arenas' concerns is concerns about um, some of the um, overlays that, that that she's concerned about. Is there? You, you laid out the process, but are are there, are there points in the process where we can have that type of analysis or study done? That's not going to require extensive uh, staff resources. Um. Chair, I, I think that um, as we develop the specific tasks for the nomination, um, you know, that we can develop some work plan um, items where by which um, and working with the community as as well in um, compiling, you know, all of the aspects of the history of the area. 
Um, we're certainly open to working with um, housing department staff and really other city staff and pulling that information together. Again, I do wanna emphasize um, there will be opportunity, this is a public process, right? So, you know, there'll be public hearings on the matter, both at the Historic Landmarks Commission, as well as the Planning Commission. So there's opportunity for the public um, to provide comments um, and perhaps, you know, make, make recommendations, right? And forward those to the city council. Again, it's the city council's final action. So there, there will be multiple opportunities and multiple bites of that apple. To... That's, that's correct. Okay, great. Council member uh, Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think certainly, uh, you know, based on the, the memorandum, um, was not necessarily expecting the depth of this conversation as it has been today. Um, I, I was not contacted by anybody from housing as it, it seems like council member Dennis was, so I didn't have that context uh, coming in, simply just looking at the, the staff response here on, on the work and having experienced myself in designating historic districts um, on what that looks like. But I do think Councilman Arenas gets sort of dives deeper into a much broader conversation, which is why I think we're, we're sort of, uh, we don't really have the answers to it today because we haven't done that. We haven't asked the questions in the past in regards to uh, things like, should we be giving historic uh, district designations to areas in our city that were were you know mapped out through redlining. Um, I think I think those are big questions, uh, no doubt, right? I, and I and I and I think actually worthy of us looking at. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to accomplish that though here at rules, especially without anybody from I think that the housing end of things to be able to respond to some of hey what would they do, how would they partner. Um, how could we include some of, of, of the fair housing work and, and what does that actually look like to ensure that if we were to, to you know, come forward, staffs to come forward at the conclusion of this work with uh, a historic district designation to the council, that we could feel comfortable accepting that. Um, and so, and, and Rosen obviously can't answer all of that because she's, her, her end is, is the second half of that, and it doesn't look like we have, I don't think anybody joined from, from housing, correct, yet, no. So, um, so that would be, that, that's, that's my, my main concern. So really, I, I don't think we have, I don't think we have uh, the right staff here to give us the, the second half of this equation. So as much as, um, you know, I think uh, I, I agree that what Councilman Rodinus is asking for is something we should be considering um, I would be comfortable, you know, putting that forward and, and asking for that as well with you, Councilman Rodinus, but I, I don't think um, tying it to this item today is, is the right way to, to go about it personally, and, and, I, and I, I would support it. I would support looking at the, the, the process itself and what areas we designate, and I think you brought up some really good points, um, but I, I, I don't necessarily think that, that this is the right space to, to be able to, to, to get that work done. Uh, and I think that we, we need the right staff here as well to be able to respond to see what that looks like. So I think it's unfortunate that maybe you've heard from some of the, the team working on the fair housing, but that they're, um, they're not necessarily here with us today to, to be able to describe a little bit about what, what they would be intent on doing. Uh, it does sound like though, Rosalind, you just responded that there could still be ways to include some of that. You're, you're, you're not familiar with it. I know why, right? Because that's not what's been done in the process before, uh, but it sounds like you're open to that on your end, correct? That's right, council member. Um, we, we would be open to it. And, you know, and I think also, um, you know, the issue is a much broader one that's just not specifically to this particular neighborhood and, and, I think it would, there would be opportunity, right, to approach it with a more comprehensive lens um, and uh, so that it's a citywide discussion as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the conversation is worthy. And in fact, never, like I said, never uh, thought of those two in regards to the, the, you know, efforts of a community wanting to have a historic district designation. Um, and then really, should we be, you know, thinking much more deeply on that. So I, I appreciate it uh, being brought up and I would support that work. And I, I think looks like we can include some of that discussion uh, organically into what you're doing, Rosalind, uh, with, with this as we, if we move forward. Um, but 
uh, I, I'm happy to, again, uh, and I'll pass it back over to Councilman Dennis, but I'm happy to work with you on something to bring forward to actually make it, uh, you know, a little bit more comprehensive and in, in, uh, across the city versus just uh, tied into this one, uh, this one community. Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate that, uh, Council Member Perales. I think um, what I'm saying is being heard, and I appreciate that. And that is what um, historically what some of these neighborhoods represent uh, for people of color, for people who haven't been able to move into one of these neighborhoods, who probably won't. And for for that kind of context to continue to exist. And you know, I want to um, I want to say that I, I wish um, that uh, my colleague was really um, mad about the history of segregation in her district and what this might represent to many of us versus being upset at me for submitting this um, substitute motion. And I would have expected for you to recognize what it would mean in terms of equity for people of color. Because policy can also lead to segregation as we have seen in redlining. So I would expect that kind of sensitivity from a colleague um, and not to make things personal to me because you did, you made it personal. And it is my right to bring up any issue that I would like within the context of what's presented in front of me, because that is my job. It would have been nice if that was what got you so upset, this segregation and redlining history in our city. And instead, you're upset with me for bringing this up. And so, it is my right to continue to talk about this as long as I'm allowed. And, um, and I'm really sad that you missed an opportunity to make this right and to actually offer um, a lot of our um, people of color who've been redlined, who have had a long history here in San Jose, because um, my, my, my parents have been here, we're a couple of generations here, um, and we're still not able to move into your specific district. So I will um, obviously be supporting mine. I can see, I can count. Um, and I just uh, lastly would like to, uh, would like to ask um, for us to continue to take a look at these policies as they are not simply what they look like um, and they're not going to do exactly what they say they are. We know because we deal with these kinds with policies every single week and inadvertently they create some inequities for some of our communities. Um, and so this is one of those policies. Um, and so um, not only is it my right to talk about this, it is also my right and my duty um, to stand up and to develop um, other policies. And so thank you for encouraging me to do that because that is exactly what I will be doing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Perez, and thank you, uh... Uh, for the committee, uh, everybody has a right to um, express their opinion, and oftentimes we have different perspectives. But I'm going to try to make an attempt, an attempt to turn down the temperature a little bit, and just acknowledge uh, uh, all of you and in, in your your perspectives and viewpoints. And everybody that I've heard today has um, actually brought uh, new information and new perspective for me on some of these issues too. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, there's no other comments. Uh, we have a, a substitute motion on the floor. So, Tony, uh, roll call, please. Arenas? Uh, yes. Cohen? Nay. Davis? No. Perales? No. Jones? No. Okay, my underlining motion was made by. Davis and seconded by Perales. I just wanted to confirm that. Yes. Okay. Ready to vote on that? Yes. Arenas? Oh, it is my right. No. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Aye. Perales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay. 
next topic is return together. And I will go to public comments. And our first speaker is Esther. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Esther Alonso y trabajo en el Marriott San José por más de 14 años. Y me gustaría que por favor apoyaran a Volviendo Juntos al Trabajo. Gracias. Que pasen buenas tardes. Okay, can I get one of the interpreters to um, interpret that for us? Okay. I'm Next sorry. is uh, Nathan. Do you do you need a moment, Tony? To get... Yeah, I'm, I don't. Um, I asked... At first, I heard a translation and then <laughs> it stopped. What I, I need, I need one of the interpreters to interpret what the speaker just said. The one who spoke to, the one. Okay, so I switched over to the English channel. I heard the interpretation. Did you guys hear that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So that's what we're going to need to do. And if if a speaker has um, like a lot to say, we need to we need them to stop um, every so often while they're speaking, so the interpreter can come in, um, so they don't have to recite the whole two minutes at once. So I'm I'm assuming the interpreters are interpreting what I'm saying right now. So if you are a public speaker and you require interpretation of your words, please pause every, I don't know, every 30 seconds or so um, and allow the interpreter to come in and interpret what you're saying for the, the I almost said commission, committee, for the committee. Yeah, the one, the one uh, flaw in that, uh, Tony, is that if they require interpretation, they probably didn't understand your instructions. Well, he's, they're listening, the, the people who are, have interpretation are listening on a Spanish channel. Okay, so they're getting those instructions translated. Yeah, they're getting those instructions translated. And then when that happens, you guys are going to need to switch over from the off position on interpretation and switch over to English. Um, that's where I was hearing the interpretation. So make sure you switch over. Okay. Okay. All right, let's give this a shot. So next is Nathan. Hey, good afternoon, Chair Jones, Vice Mayor Prowess, and Rural Committee members. Uh, thank you for giving us a minute to share our thoughts here. More specifically, some concerns at the moment regarding the proposed return together ordinance. We understand and appreciate the memo from Council Member Prowess, Jimenez, and Cohen, and the desire for hospitality rehire ordinance citywide, but we should be careful to impose a hiring process as we are cognizant some of these businesses would default to rehiring former employees without this policy in place. I will note one of our hospitality members has strong concerns about this is they currently abide by their own policy that reflects much of what is being presented today, i.e. rehiring by seniority. Also, it has, uh, it, the, the, excuse me, also it has uh, been difficult to get a response from former employees as well. So part of this could be that Former employees are claiming EDD and federal aid that are equal, the same, or sometimes more than what they could be paid uh, returning onto the job, which leads into question about the legalities of, of back pay and how that is enforced. These are just a few concerns from one member. Apart from that, there are some legal implications and other liabilities that our business community will need to consider as well. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it if we and our business members had more time to vet the proposed ordinance prior to voting on this today and eventually to council. Uh, we had less than a a week to consider this item and then was posted on the 18th, but once again, appreciate uh, the candor here. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Hi, uh, thank you for this item. Uh, I thought it, it should be a time that I, uh, I'm, you know, I try to learn to, to offer a few things that uh, can be kind of matter of fact and obvious, but yet we don't really want to talk about them. 
And it's hard to do that work. And so thanks for your patience here and me only trying to learn how to practice how to do that myself. Um, there's a concept of uh, uh, aerosol vaccines. That's an important part of the uh, COVID uh, healing process, you know, and part of what I think is how, you know, part of the HVAC systems and how kids can go back to school. And that I think was a major part, yet it's a subject people don't want to really openly talk about and acknowledge. And I'm, I hope that uh, my speaking about it here just allows that space to happen where it can be okay, like to ask, is your HVAC system at your school using uh, a certain aerosol vaccine? You know, is it, that, that, that language is difficult. And uh, I, think it has, I think it has to do with COVID issues and, and returning to work. And so people can feel safe in their workplace, sir. So I'm trying to offer that at this time. And uh, I think it's an important concept. And um, I think I'm about done. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Jose? Vice Mayor Jose needs to update his Zoom software so we can allow him to speak. So if you can take a moment to, to update to the most recent version of Zoom or call in from a phone then he can re-raise his hand and we'll allow him to speak at that time. Okay, so we'll come back to him. Uh, Luce? Go ahead. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Luz de María Aguilar y soy miembro del sindicato local 19. Estoy aquí 100% apoyando a los trabajadores de la hospitalidad de San José que necesitan la ordenanza municipal para volver a trabajar juntos. Muchas gracias. Okay, this is Tony. I heard all of that on the English channel. I did too. Okay. It worked. Good. All right. Jocelyn? Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Morrison. Um, I worked at the Fairmont Hotel for 30 years. And um, and I would just like to say that um, our hotel has closed and we are all laid off. It's a very sad time. Is someone translating this or you just want me to keep going? Uh, keep going. Okay, it's a very sad time. Um, we put in so much work making the Fairmont Hotel a pillar of San Jose hospitality industry. Me and my daughter have no income, and I know this is very stressful time for all me, for me and my coworkers as well. The Return Together Ordinance is, a, is an opportunity for you to make sure employees do the right thing. Please think of me and my coworkers and move forward. Thank you. Hashtag stop Asian hate. Thank you. Um, Maji? Majai? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. My name is Majid Pargi, and I work for Holiday in San Jose Airport for the last 30 years. I'm a member of Unite Here Local 19. Please support the Return Together Ordinance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Maria? Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria de Rueda, and I work as a banquet captain at the Double Three San Jose for 21 years. I was laid off due to COVID and my husband had his hours reduced. We had to tell our son that we could no longer afford his university tuition. I want to get my job back when this is all over so that, so that I can start paying for his education again and start planning for the future education of my two younger daughters. I dream of my children 
being the first in our family to earn a degree. I am thankful that our employer agreed to recall language so I can dream again about building for my children's future. Please support this ordinance so all hospitality workers can have hope again. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie? Go ahead, Eddie. Actually, um, uh, Ms. Rain? Yes. Hi, how are you? Yes, my name is uh, Ms. Rain Mendoza. Okay. I work at uh, Cisco Systems, and uh, I want you guys to please support this uh, uh, bill that is going to help uh, our, my brothers and sisters uh, from the hospitality work uh, continue. The, the only thing, guys, we want is just go back to work. Okay, make these guys from the hotels and the hospitality industry do the right thing. You guys know what to do. Please, just, just, just make it happen. Please, give us a chance. We only thing that we want is go back to work together. Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Eddie? Thank you, Vice Mayor Jones and City Council members. My name is Eddie Trong from the Silicon Valley Organization, the region's largest chamber of commerce. I'm here today to voice my organization's concerns that there has not been sufficient time to conduct stakeholder outreach and that the city should conduct a thoughtful outreach process before rushing to enact any new ordinance by April 6. The proposed policy would require private employers to rehire laid off employees by order of seniority without much consideration about the new legal complexities that would create. Many employers that we have spoken to may find themselves attempting to manage these new complexities instead of rehiring employees once the economy bounces back. Additionally, the proposed ordinance would allow the city of San Jose to pursue litigation against hospitality employers and potentially require, require them to pay back wages for the affected employee. This would be a tremendous new legal liability when really we should be focusing on accelerating vaccinations, opening the economy, and getting more people back to work with a dignified job. The memo does not identify a covered employer that would be subject to the ordinance, but they do identify card rooms, event centers of more than 50,000 square foot feet, food service contractors and hotels that may be required to comply with the proposed law because it was identified in the term of definitions. At the end of the day, government can do just as much harm as it can do good. The city of San Jose should be thoughtful and deliberate in their approach to craft public policies that do not harm through unintended consequences and slow recovery for hospitality workers and the entire industry. It would not benefit our community if the city council were to adopt an ordinance that is copy pasted from another city in a matter of weeks. We urge you to be, take a more thoughtful process and the SBO stands ready to assist you with stakeholder outreach with the hospitality industry to get their feedback on the matter. Thank you for your consideration of my comments. Thank you, Iris. Uh, actually, um, um, uh, Myra. Um, or Mayra. You're up next. Okay, we lost you. Um, Iris? Go ahead, Iris. Take yourself off mute. Okay, Iris. Uh, go ahead, Iris. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Iris Mejía. Trabajo para Bon Appetit en Google por 15 años. Soy miembro de Google y estoy aquí apoyando al 100% a los Estoy apoyando al 100% a los trabajadores de hospitalidad de San José y necesitan la ordenanza municipal para volver a trabajar juntos. Necesito, por favor. Again, I need, please, that you give them back their job 
to have conscious and to have the conscious enough that it's a year that we have not been working, that they have not been working. And we all have a family that has to support, that we have to support. Please help them. Everybody needs to work. We have families to support and care for. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Luis. Um, good afternoon, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships USA. Uh, and I want to thank you for introducing and encourage support for this policy. Uh, the proposed return together policy is a lifeline for San Jose workers who have been affected and are still affected by mass layoffs and the ongoing economic downturn due to COVID-19. Tens of thousands of our neighbors are still laid off due to the pandemic and don't know when they'll go back to work. Hotel, event, and hospitality workers, as we all know, are among the hardest hit, uh, and many of them will not go back quickly. They face many months before those industries fully recover, maybe even years. Hotel employment in Santa Clara County remains down more than any other industry due to COVID. And as we also know, the workers in these industries are overwhelmingly people of color, immigrants, and women, exactly the people who have already been hardest hit in many other ways by COVID-19. And now many of those people fear that even when their industries finally do start to reopen, longtime workers might be left out. People who've committed decades of their life to those jobs may be excluded from returning to work. As council members, you have the opportunity here to give workers hope that they will have jobs to go back to when things eventually get better. Uh, this isn't new or novel. Cities across California, including Santa Clara right next door, have already passed similar policies that help provide hope to those hardest hit workers. Workers urgently need this little piece of security and hope, as you've heard from so many today. Uh, please support this policy so that we can all begin to return together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Okay, let's try um, again, Sarah. There's the button. Hello, my name is Sarah Julian. I am a member of Unite Here Local 19, and I am here to support 100% the um, ordinance return together. Thank you. Thank you. Laura? Laura, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Of Good evening. So, hi, my name is Laura Reyes, and I am a member of the Unite Here Local 19, and I stand with San Jose Hospitality Workers in supporting the Return Together Ordinance. We all deserve to have a job. I mean, they don't want to live in state assistance they want to work they want to be available to provide for their own families I mean, the pandemic is nobody else's fault nobody's fault they do deserve to get back to work thank you thank you sarah hi can you hear me yes we can hi my name is sarah mcdermott i'm the political director of unite here local 19 um, and I'd like to thank Council Member Perales for championing this issue, along with Council Members Cohen and Jimenez. Um, COVID-19 has devastated hospitality workers with an estimated 90% of hotel workers out of work nationally. Uh, one year into the, to unemployment, hospitality workers are asking for one thing, the right to, uh, to get their former jobs back as the industry returns. We have already secured the right to recall from many of our union employers, including Doubletree, Hilton, Hyatt Place, Holiday Inn, Marriott, and Team San Jose. But we must make sure that all hospitality workers have this right. Unfortunately, some hotels have yet to sign on to this simple no cost commitment. The recent closure of the Fairmont San Jose for rebranding highlights the need for this ordinance. 
Similar policies have been passed in San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, and Santa Clara. This is a minimum labor standard like the minimum wage, so you as a council have the authority to pass this ordinance. Please move forward uh, so we can return together. Finally, a gentleman mentioned that maybe our members were getting by on benefits. I'd like to invite him to come to our food distribution line three days a week so that he can see how our members are getting by. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Um, when a piece of legislation comes forth that uh, serves the purposes of justice, of the dignity of the hu of the human being, and the dignity of the worker, the ones that sustain and do the work that no one else will do, and they do it with pride, and they do it with dignity every single time that they show up to work. And so I think that this, this piece of legislation um, fits that in terms of what comes forth from the city to protect its citizens and to, to, to give them justice. Because what has befallen us is unjust in so many layered ways. I would like to also thank uh, Councilwoman Arenas that you not only have a right to say what you said in this forum, but you have a moral obligation to the ancestors that have suffered and continue, the descendants continue to suffer under the weight of that indifference and that apathy. And I would go so far as to say sadism that comes out of District 6 and its representatives. And so I really want to thank you because on multiple layers, you gave the voice that they slapped out of my mother's mouth when they taught her that it was a shameful, humiliating thing to be Mexican in this city. And that's what built Willow Glen. Now, uh, to Vice Mayor Chappie Jones, I wouldn't exactly ask you to lower the temperature if it was an issue that involved the brothers. I would ask you to extend. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Patricia? Okay. Patricia? Yeah, ¿me escucha? Yeah, you're Do you on. hear me? Do you hear me? Sí, a continuación. Yes. Thank you. I'm really thankful that you are taking my call. My name is Patricia Barragán. I have worked in Fairmont for 26 years, and I would like for you to help us to approve this pr proposed law. We all need to go back to work for all of us. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Dolores? Hi, good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Dolores Dominguez and I, I am a work at Banquet Service at the Double Tree San Jose for 17 years. Working at the Double Tree, I have been able to build a life. I'm proud of my two children. I've been had a great health coverage and a stable home. In March of 2020, my co-workers and I were laid off mm -hmm. because of the COVID-19 pandemic. At first, it was a scare. Of what will happen if when it's finally safe to reopen we don't get our job back it is been so hard to figure out our health care insurance and we been have to dip into our savings thankfully our employee agrees to recall language i am proud to be a part of a strong union and fat for those protections and today we stand with all the hospitality workers in San Jose to support in the return work ordinance. In the hospitality industry, so many service workers are immigrant women like me who have fought to improve conditions across our industry. All hospitality workers should have the basic right to recall. That's why we stand here 
today united as a hospitality workers to call for action by the city. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Mayra? Mayra? I'm ahead. sorry. Yes, my name is Myra Rodriguez and I've worked for the Fairmont Hotel for more than 15 years. And I am here and I stand with the San Jose Hospitality Workers in supporting the Return Together Ordinance. It hasn't been easy. And we ask for you council members to please help us in this issue. I uh, would appreciate it so much. Uh, God bless and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, United here, Local 19. Vice Mayor, uh, Unite Here Local 19 needs to uh, update their Zoom or call in by phone so we can allow them to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, Letty? Go ahead, Letty. Okay. My name is Letty Herrera Flores and I work at Nan Union Hotel. I am a resident at San Jose. Please make sure all employers do the right thing and give San Jose hospitality workers their former jobs back as trouble returns. Please stand with hospitality workers and pass the return together ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Jose? Go ahead, Jose. You hear me? Yes. Okay. You hear me, right? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. My. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is I'm a higher place downtown San Jose. I we working there for 35 years. I'm also a member of Unite here for local 19. I'm here pro to propose uh, the now and may follow hospitality for workers have come together during this pandemic and we are doing uh, food distribution three days a week. And also I've been helping people to get a register and get an appointment for the vaccine and also getting uh, uh, local members of the local 19 to get a health care insurance, health care. My uh, employer has already agree to recall agreements, but I'm here today to stand and we are hospitality workers in San Jose. I ask you to support and return together ordinance. San Jose must return back together. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Buenas tardes, soy Miguel de la Mora. My name is Miguel de la Mora. I work in the Hotel Fairmont for 30 years. And thanks to that job, for 30 years, I have been able to bring my family forward. And now that this happened, like a bucket of cold water to all San Jose and the whole entire United States, the only thing I ask is that you help us because we need we are very bad and we need your support and we hope you can support us and I wish you a good day. Thank you. And that is all of our public speakers. So before we go back, bring it back to the committee. I know Nora had some input that she wanted to provide to us. So Nora. Um, thank you. and. Uh, I, there were just um, a few concerns that I had um, about our office's ability to do some of the things that are recommended in the memo. Um, those are, uh, we're, ju we're just ill-equipped and I learned um, pointedly 
uh, as we were going through the uh, grocery store ordinance to provide um, informational memos and those kinds of things that really is best done by OED or other staff. And then um, I, I haven't had a chance to do any research on it, um, but I would like an opportunity to um, have a discussion when this comes back in, in closed session because I'm, I'm concerned that there may be some legal issues that we need to vet or sort out a little bit. And Nora, how much time were you looking um, I think Lee, did we? I think we were talking about this coming to uh, being referred to council on the 13th um, okay. for direction at that point. Yeah, we had talked about closed session and possibly open session for this item on April 13th. Okay. Thank you. Is that it, Nora? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, First up is Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I know there wasn't a response from, from staff on uh, the early consideration response form. So I don't know if that's what your intent, Nora, was to, to sort of give that indication here um, in your, your comment. So it sounds like that's what it was, correct? Yeah, I, and I can speak to that Council Member. I think um, as Nora indicated, even before there's a form here kind of lessons learned from from previous ordinance um, there's a lot more information the administration would want as Nora does that research to be able to clearly articulate to you whether it is a green or a yellow light um, and quite frankly to hear your own kind of expectations on that implementation and enforcement because part of it could read fairly simple but the other part could read fairly time intensive so I think you know letting the attorney's office do that research and bring it to you in closed session um, so Matt, myself, and others can make a, a clear recommendation on what that would look like from our perspective. Great, thank you, Yen. Happy to engage in that further conversation, whether it be in, in close session, and, and I'm comfortable, although I've asked for the sixth uh, on, on one week further, if, if that's what staff needs to be able to come back. Um, and I can say much like I think we've we've addressed in the past with some of these ordinances, there's not a, a strong desire to have some sort of robust, um, you know, uh, enforcement action tied to it at the end that, you know, it, it's really something that, that we would be looking at. Um, an individual coming forward, right, bringing something, um, you know, action forward based on, on if they feel that they uh, were, if their employer was not following the ordinance. And that's very consistent, I think, across the board, what we've done before, so then that we were not necessarily out there being some sort of enforcement arm on it um, and appreciate that. So I'll just jump into some of my comments. Um, so first off, thank you to uh, the speakers of the public that um, were willing to come out today. Uh, I know you are individuals uh, that have been out of work for uh, likely a year uh, and you're, you serve in an industry um, that does not have, uh, you know, tremendous, um, anticipation for, for being able to reopen soon as, as you know, uh, information comes out around things like the, the moving in the, the tiers to orange tier, uh, that still doesn't give you um, this green light to be able to know that you can come back to work soon. But I know what it does do, it gives you a sense of hope, it gives you a sense of hope that sometime later this year, and by all indications, actually, there is uh, industry reports that are showing, as my uh, memo detailed, that we may see hotel industry uh, back at a 55% capacity. Um, and the fact that we keep moving in a positive direction, I know it gives uh, individuals that spoke today hope that they will be able to return to work. But where that hope can uh, completely be eliminated would be if uh, they were not given any kind of assurance that they can go and return to a job, as we heard from some of the speakers, that they've been at for 29, 30 years. Um, to me, this is a no-brainer policy. Uh, I think that's why we've seen it passed by a lot of cities up and down the state. Um, and in fact, why I think it's already been uh, embraced by a number of hotels, uh, for instance, the Hilton, Hyatt Place, Holiday Inn, Marriott, uh, and by Team San Jose. Um, again, because I think this is a no-brainer policy to be able to really offer uh, workers, uh, their job, right? Give a priority and, and send that signal to them that, hey, as our industry is able to reopen, we want to go to those workers that have served us and served our community for decades. 
Um, and, and really that's, that's the goal here. Uh, it's no secret what's happened to our hospitality industry. Um, 90% of hospitality workers have been out of work due to this pandemic. Uh, one of the hardest hit industries, as we know, not someone that can simply do as we've done here in, in so many in, the, in, in Silicon Valley and in, in the tech community, even us here on the council, being able to work from home remotely, uh, not have our paychecks impacted. Uh, these individuals are standing regularly in food lines. Um, as, uh, as Sarah McDermott stated in regards to their members. Um, this is a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel based on what's moving forward. Um, and, and, and a policy like this can give somebody, uh, again, that, that, uh, that hope that, that they will need to know that simply they can do something, which all of us uh, should be humbled by, just to go back to work. <laughs> they're, they're asking to go back to work. Um, not asking to, 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 to have handouts. They're simply asking uh, to be offered a job back. Um, and uh, that's why uh, my colleagues and I, Councilmember Cohen here, thank you, and Councilmember Jimenez put forth this memo um, uh, so that we can all return to work together. Um, and uh, this is a no cost way for us to be able to promote recovery, uh, a path for our hospitality workers uh, to be able to rebuild their livelihoods um, it will be able to, to help ensure that the industry can get back up and running without a hitch, because again, the cooks, the housekeepers, bartenders, the servers, all of those that have been the backbones of our hotels and our conventions uh, that know how to do this work uh, should be the ones that, that, that go back to work. Um, and uh, we want all 3,000 plus workers here to be called back to work in San Jose. Um, and we know that, that neighboring cities, as I pointed out, San Diego, uh, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Santa Clara most recently have all passed these ordinances. Um, and, and so really uh, that's, that's our interest here to see that we can do the same. Um, this hasn't been a reinvention of the wheel. You see the, the, the draft language is simply that that's been brought up to help staff. Um, certainly, and we've done this before, there's no uh, intent that we that we adopt the language uh, word by word, uh, but merely to to not have to reinvent the wheel on something that's now passed across the state. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll say just in regards to the concerns raised by SJDA and the SVO on timing, I'll say that uh, this is simply the timing for all non-urgent memos. Uh, and we know this past year uh, we've seen a lot of actions proposed um, that were done under urgency ordinance designations uh, and that's not what's happening here so this is not some sort of uh, process that's been sped up uh, i submitted a memo and under the regular process uh, a week later it's arrived here at rules uh, and now we're discussing when it's going to come back to council which i was requesting uh, two weeks and now we're looking at three and so there's no sort of uh, rush timing here uh, this is simply a regular process uh, and I'm happy to connect with, um, with both your organizations and any other stakeholders that feel they have concerns prior to that April 13th date. Um, and I will say that based on some of the comments that you may have missed, uh, some of the language in the memo, because it does actually include considerations for seniority. Um, and um, uh, again, it's just, uh, it's the draft language that we have here uh, to be able to move forward and, um, and happy to be able to meet on that regard. So thank you uh, to staff, Nora, for your, your response. It sounds like you'll be able to come back and have a, a, a more in-depth conversation with us. I hope that uh, all my colleagues can support this. Uh, again, what I feel is a, really a no-brainer uh, action to move forward. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the memo co-signed by me, Councilmember Cohen and, and Jimenez. Second. All right. So and that will, that will include the 13th date as a return. Got it. All right, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, I'm Councilmember Perales said, you know, I agree with everything he said, so I don't, I'm not going to take much time except thank the people, uh, members of the public who came to speak and talk about their experiences and um, help us understand how important this is to, to them and their families. Um, and so I appreciate them being here. Um, just, just a question regarding timeline, um, April 13th, Sounds like April thirteenth is a good time to bring this back to discuss. Are we discuss? Are we still considering having an ordinance prepared? Because I think that's kind of what the language says: is bringing an ordinance back by the thirteenth, or is really that thirteenth a discussion? Since the, you probably need more time for the ordinance itself, um, what what would that look like? 
I, um, if the question is to me and yeah, I guess it, it is in terms of the, you can't tell that I'm looking at you on my, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. no, no, it's okay. These Sorry. are impossible. It looked like you were looking at Lee and I kept thinking, uh, yeah, well, I <laughs> <laughs> Lee's going to write it. That's great. That's the best news I've had. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, we would like the direction um, on the 13th rather than having to bring it back. And, and part of the reason is um, I do want an opportunity to uh, coordinate um, with the city manager's office. Um, we, we had some post coordination recently on the grocer bill and um, OED was most helpful in, in putting together information um, that our office just isn't really equipped to provide and and I think we were pretty flat-footed with the public so I'd like to get that coordination in place uh, I guess that would mean that the the motion would be more that we would be bringing this back for discussion on the 13th for preparate for for, for um, direction at that time to prepare an ordinance I, mean, I don't know if we need to specify that or not but that's my only mm -hmm. comment about the motion itself is that okay with the uh, maker of the motion? Yeah, I would prefer to, to be able to discuss some, even if it was a draft, I mean, that would give us something more to discuss. That's why I've kind of provided a draft here, right? So to, to aid you in that, if we're merely having a similar discussion to what we're having today, with just maybe more staff there, but there hasn't really been any thought in language, then I don't know how fruitful that will be. So is, is that possible that, that, that you actually could come back with something that we can debate on? Um, I, if it's the 13th, I think we can um, come back with a with um, a draft and then have areas where identify areas either where we have some concerns and we want to review that um, with the council uh, and or um, get a little more direction on certain issues as, as they may come up. One of the things, for example, is um, right now it's structured for our office to be um, uh, litigating issues if if the ordinance isn't followed that's not how the grocer ordinance was and um that's uh, that may or may not be a big demand on our office but it, it um it i i can see how there may be um evidentiary issues and trying to track down the information we would need to have and all of that because it's different than um uh, for example, a construction company that has to provide us with their um, wage records that are um, under penalty of perjury. Um, that, that's easier to chase in many ways than um, perhaps some of the problems that might occur with this. So that I, I, I could be comfortable with, and I recognize mm -hmm. that, that that's, again, why this is sort of drafted in itself. This is helping you, I think, then to take a look and see what things you may want to, you know, change and make more mm -hmm. relevant for, for us or give us other options that make more sense. Um, and, and that I just would rather have a more fruitful conversation then rather than mm -hmm. maybe a repeat conversation of this with just more people. So that would be helpful if, if, if it sounds like you can do it and it sounds like you does, or it sounds like mm -hmm. you can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rance. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have my message in Spanish because I know there was a lot of Spanish speakers. Um, so I want to thank everybody who called, who called, you took your time today to call, to give your testimony today about the impact that you have had from the COVID because of the loss of your jobs, but not because it's been caused by you, but because of the pandemic that is out of our control. And what I what I heard is that there's a lot of unity amongst all the workers who have lost their jobs that are in the hospitality industry, in the service industry. And that makes me very proud. It gives makes me proud to know that our community is going very united and it's gonna to continue to be united because that's how we form and we have strength. Politica. Um, con que les, les pido que, que vuelvan a llamar cuando este tema um, se presente en frente del concilio. 
para que de esa manera ustedes puedan um, dar su voz nuevamente a, al alcalde y al resto del concilio, porque ahorita nomás somos cinco. Because right now we're only five members of the council. Uh, of the five, uh, five members of the complete council. And for their and, and support and their network that they've created, um, the recognition of loss of work uh, that is out of their control, and ask them to speak once again uh, when this item comes to us um, uh, with a full council and the mayor. Um, and uh, and lastly, I, I want to say that there were some folks that that called in, and um, obviously I'm going to support this um, based on my message now. Um, I think you can surmise that. Um, and I was really disappointed to hear some people, um, especially from the business community, saying, you know, that what they needed to do was focus on some of the complexities of, of, of recovery um, versus, you know, being bound to this um, return together ordinance, which to me does not make sense because this facilitates the rehiring and um, the reduction of retraining um, that will be very beneficial for a lot of this industry. And so um, I'm gonna continue to support it. I hope that, that our businesses here in San Jose can see those same benefits um, that when you train a new set of uh, folks, that's, that's a loss, right? That's a loss of, of the training that you actually garnered before and that you invested before. Um, the loss of jobs and before this pandemic that was out of the uh, really out of control of the the employees that were impacted. Uh, I just want to say that what I said is the businesses, how can they see this as an opportunity to to have the employment of job the return of jobs to people who are already trained and, uh, and thank you for all the advocates who've uh, also made the time to um uh, pull people together and uh, really get a, a feel for um who's out there in terms of when we talk about people who have lost their jobs people who are um in food lines people who um are really just struggling these are the voices unfortunately we can't see their faces but these are these are the folks Um, and so the one and the same, when we talk about um, other policies, these are the same folks. Um, and so when we want recovery, when we want to um, make sure that folks are not homeless, then we have to do things like this to make sure that people get back to work quickly. Thank you. Thank you, council member. So that's it for um, comments. Uh, we have a motion. Um, Tony? Arenas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay. So next is open forum. And the first speaker is Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, quote from Martin Luther King, our nation was born in genocide. We are perhaps the only nation which tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. That is, a, that is a serious indictment. And we saw that demonstrated today with Deb Davis's policy. It, it just this complete willful ignorance and, 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 and indifference to the suffering that was created so that Willow Glen and Rose Garden can exist. SVO had an opportunity to atone for promotion of racial fear that they're still responsible for. I don't care who you change. That organization is racist to the core. And for slandering the legitimacy of our First Amendment rights to protest 
SVO also contributed to Dev Davis's uh, political uh, campaign. Now, either SVO is sociopathic, and a sociopath is just somebody that ha is literally incapable of experiencing human compassion. And compassion is twofold. Number one, the subjective feeling of empathy or sympathy, and the objective, meaning that the person is now compelled to do something to alleviate that suffering. They had an opportunity here, and they showed their true colors. So I'm going to just leave it at that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. It's a tough march. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I really, I, one of my words, uh, I know they didn't speak to the item on the previous item, but I, I really try to make my words connect to the item subject matter. I never try to stray off a subject. I have a real specific purpose when I speak on subject matter to speak, you know, to, to related subjects. And I think uh, aerosol vaccines have played an important part in our uh, in our development, how we, we've been working the past uh, six months. And it should be acknowledged and talked about, and it shouldn't be a, a fearful subject. So thanks. Um, with that said, uh, uh, about the uh, council, uh, Councilperson Cohen's uh, memo to come up with, with new uh, ideas for the public meeting process, um, I hope that maybe you can have a color coordinated system for uh, when you update uh, council agendas, uh, red, yellow, and green. Uh, red being, you know, uh, green being, you know, two weeks before an agenda appears. Uh, yellow being if you make changes within 72 hours. And red being if you make changes within uh, 24 hours. And that could be, uh, you know, on the, on, the, uh, on the website. And you can just quickly see the red, yellow, green and know where the agendas are at. And about the, uh, thank you for the Spanish translation. Good luck on, on hiring. Uh, I'll talk about that issue more. I, I wish the city employees can do that job and work out with union people, how that can be, they can do it for a much cheaper price, I feel. And to conclude, um, you know, I really liked, uh, everyone had interesting words. Uh, Council person Arena has made something very open and clear what we have to work on. And, uh, you know, we missed an opportunity to, to to have the east side issues, the whole purpose of Google is to address east side issues, and that could have been a good opportunity to do that. I hope uh, staff will, will look over uh, Sylvia Reynos's ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the number ending in 4963. Hi, Martha O'Connell. I have an observation. It's, it's not a criticism. It's something that I just discovered today. Uh, I, I, I called into the meeting on the telephone, and when the folks were talking in Spanish, obviously the telephone couldn't translate what they were saying, because I'm interested in listening to my fellow citizens. So I, I ran in the back room, and I hopped on the computer, and I got on to, you know, watch a public meeting, and there, there was nothing, well, maybe there was, but I just didn't see any way to translate on the computer what the people were saying. So I don't know what we can do about it, but I, for one, as a non-Spanish speaker, would like to know what my Spanish-speaking uh, fellow citizens are saying. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the last public speaker. So the meeting is adjourned.